Welcome, everybody, to Entity Component System Architecture with Unity by example. So I am Simon. This is Maxime. Yeah, and we will be your bartenders for the next one hour. So enjoy and <laughs> yeah, have a so nice time. Yeah, so Maxime and me, we met at VUGA. And VUGA is a games company based in Berlin. And we are around 300 people from all around the world. And VUGA is really focused on creating the best mobile casual games. And maybe you heard about Wooga already before from games like Diamond Dash or Chalice Splash, Pearl's Peril, or our most recent hit, um, Futurama. You should definitely check that one out. It's awesome. <laughs> well, Maxime and me, we're both pretty excited to be here again this year because we've been here last year already at Unite Europe 2015, and we introduced Entitas, which is an entity component system um, library we've created. And the reason for that is when we switched from native iOS development to Unity, we had a few pain points that we wanted to address with this. And those were testability, because we are actually working in a test-driven way. We talked about code sharing, because we wanted to use the logic we, uh, we are writing for our clients for the mobile phone. We wanted to be able to run the same logic on the backend server for example, for simulation games to validate a battle or to prevent cheating. We talked about codependent logic and fast and efficient querying, and also about the stuff we like to do the most, which is deleting code. So when we want to get rid of a feature, the best thing we can imagine is just delete the folder and no more work to do. So last year, we addressed all these things, and we showed how entity component system architecture helped us to solve all these problems. Well, if you haven't seen this talk, you, it is recorded, so you can go to YouTube and just uh, search for Entitas Unity, and you will find the result. Or you can go to tinyurl.com slash Entitas. This will redirect you to the official GitHub repository, because Entitas is actually open source. So you can use it today if you want, and um, you can participate. So just curious, who of you saw already the talk from last year or used Entitas? Awesome, quite a bit. Cool, that's great. Um, in case you haven't uh, heard of it before, don't worry, because we will start this um, talk actually with an introduction to Entitas. We will share the vision and the ideas behind it, and also we show you all the classes you have to know in order to understand what we're talking about. After that, we want to uh, focus on what this talk is about this year, which is we want to show solutions and give answers to questions we received over the last year uh, since we introduced Entitas. And those questions were, how do you um, work with Unity's user, user input? Or how do you integrate it with physics and collisions that you can use with uh, Unity? We want to also go and uh, talk about real playable games and how to integrate UI. And you should uh, listen closely, because there will also be a quiz. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to start introducing uh, Entitas again by comparing it to Unity, because you guys know that the best already. So with Unity, you always start with an empty game object. And based on, mono on the mono behaviors you will add to this game object, you actually turn it into something specific. If you add maybe a few wheels, an engine and a steering wheel, you will maybe create a car. Or you can also add a tree or a spaceship component, whatever. So you compose your game objects. And this idea is really similar to Entitas, where you start with an empty entity, and you can just add different kinds of components. So that looks pretty similar. So what's the, what's the big deal? What's the difference? So the main difference is, in Unity, components have both. They have data and behavior. Data is, for example, uh, just private or public fields, for example, for speed or health. And you have awake, start, update methods, where you put your actual logic. In Entitas components, they are data only, and that's the important part. So I'd like to just give you an example. Here are two components in Entitas, a position component and a movable component. And we see the position only as a vector 3, and the movable doesn't even have any fields, because if you add it to something, this means you are movable. And there's no logic. We don't inherit from any objects. We just implement the I component. And that's uh, ba basically the big difference. And in this picture, I tried to show the whole idea of Entitas. So we briefly talked about components and entities. And you see entities are just a set of components. 
So there's the pool and the groups that's left. So what's the pool? This is basically the entity manager. You use the entity manager or the pool to create new entities or to destroy existing ones. So this class actually knows about all entities. And the cool thing is it enables you to do um, cool stuff like asking the pool, hey, give me everything that has a position or a velocity. Um, and in order to improve that, uh, not that you don't have to iterate through all existing entities to find all these who have a position and a velocity, we introduce groups, which is a performance optimization and which will give you the result immediately. It's pretty nice. And now we'd like to think of all that as the matrix, where all the data is just laid out in front of you, and you can see anything, you can get anything, and you can also modify anything. And if you compare that to traditional object-oriented programming, or if you used MVC or something like that, you kind of try to model the real world. You, if you try to create a, class, uh, a car class, for example, you can literally stand in front of a car and say, OK, I have a car, I do a car class, I see some wheels, I add some wheels, whatever. So you model it like the real world. But that, that only uh, also has some limits. So if the feature will change in the future, which it, which it most certainly will, uh, and you will have some trouble maybe because if you want to make it fly or if you want to make this car go underwater, maybe you have to add wings, so you have to tear out the, uh, the, the doors or have some, to make some more space between the wheels, for example. So you, there's a lot of work involved because it's really rigid. And if you make the switch, in, in the mindset switch, and you see there are actually no objects, everything is just data, and you compose the stuff together, this is actually when you realize there is no spoon, and you can bend reality and all the features like you wish. And um, yeah, this is probably how it feels like if you go for the real spoon. <laughs> all right, so that's the data and the state. And what about the logic? Because for a game and an application, we need logic to work on this data. And in Antitas, all logic belongs to systems. I'd like to give an example. This is a velocity system. So what does it do? It takes an existing position, and the velocity adds both together, and you calculate the new position. Pretty easy. So and that's exactly what's happening here. We've seen the execute. We ask the pool for a group. Give me everything that has a velocity and a position. And at this point of time, we don't really care what it is. If it's a car, a spaceship, a bird, a house, a stone, we don't care. As long as it has a velocity and a position, we're going to process this data. Once we have it, we iter iterate over those uh, entities and just, as I said, replace the position by adding the new velocity. So this system just does one single thing, applying to the single responsibility principle, and it's also really easy to test. You can just set up an entity with position and velocity, run the system once, and assert a new position. Pretty nice. Now, in the end, you will end up with a list of systems, each doing one single thing. This is basically your game loop. Now, just imagine how easy it is to introduce a new feature, how, to, how easy it is to add a new system into this list, or how easy it is to remove one feature out of this list. And we're going to see this later in a demo also. Now, in Antitas, there are three different types of systems. We just saw the execute system already, the velocity thing, um, which is supposed to be run every frame. We also have one initialized system, which is intended to be run just once in the beginning. And we have something which is rather unique to Antitas, which is a reactive system. And the cool thing about this is it just processes changed entities that you're actually interested in. Now imagine you have a render view system, for example, uh, which, where, where you want to render, uh, update the transform of a game object based on the position it has. Now, if you have thousands of entities with this view and position, but only 10 of them change the position, you don't want to iterate over all of them and update the view, because it's just necessary to update those 10. And this is exactly when you want to use a reactive system. All right, now that was the basic theory and introduction about Antitas. Now we'd like to dive in more into how we actually solve user input and collision system. So I've prepared a demo for that, which is just a simple shoot em up game which are simple cubes and stuff. And the purpose of it is to show how to use physics and input with it. But before we go into this, I'd like to also show you how we actually integrated Antitas into Unity so we can leverage the power Unity provides to all of us, the, the hierarchy, the, uh, the inspector, and all this good stuff. All right, let's just take a look at this game. 
So I'm, I'm the spaceship. I can control it with the arrow keys, and I can just shoot and shoot a few enemies. Now let's take a look how this is actually implemented. So we see the pool here. Uh, sorry, it's this one. So, and if you select it, you see some information about the pool, how many entities you have right now, and you can unfold it. So you see all the entities, basically, that currently are in the pool. Now, if I select this one, this is an entity, I can also see which components are added to this entity. This one is the spaceship, for example. We see it has an asset, a position, a velocity, and so on. Now, if I hit the arrow keys, I can also see the values change in real time. And, of course, the other way around, because everything is reactive, and using reactive systems, you can uh, just update the values here as well. This is, um, this is also the view it will um, update all the time, the actual ga game object spaceship. And we can also just inline in the inspector, we can render the entity, which is pretty nice, and also can just change the values here as well. We can also visualize the logic, not only the data. So the logic, if you cl uh, click on systems, you can see in this graph how currently all your systems perform, and you see the list I was talking about earlier, which is your game loop. You see all your lists, uh, sorry, all your system in the list. And now the cool thing about this is you can just simply deactivate or activate systems just by clicking this button. For example, if I deselect process move input, if I click the arrow keys, nothing happens. If I activate it again, it works. Same is true, for example, for Collision, if I turn off the collisions, the bullets just go through. And if I activate it again, um, collisions are on again. And so it's just imagine how easy it is, as I said, to activate features, to introduce new features. And everyone in your team, also the game designers, can just play around with different sets of features and how the uh, game will feel. It's pretty nice. And for example, A-B testing gets really simple. And I didn't do anything special here, no magic. That's just what you get if you use anti-task. That's basically built in and for free. All right, I'd like to show you something else, which is pretty cool, I think, um, with something we call blueprints. And what the blueprint is, is basically a prefab for anti-task. So it's a pre-configured entity. So everyone in your team can just create those and edit those in a really easy way without having to write any code. For example, here's a bullet. We see it has a bullet component, and it deals one damage. You could add another, uh, a few other components, remove them, and just um, uh, work with it. Um, same is true here for the enemy. We have an asset, an enemy, and it has a health of three. And those blueprints are used when you create new entities. So I can go ahead and cheat, for example. I can just select the bullet, and instead of dealing one damage, I just deal 10. So now one single bu bullet should be enough to destroy an enemy. Now I can cheat again and maybe increase the health of each um, of those enemies. And now one bullet is not enough anymore. I hit to have to hit them twice. So the, cool th the coolest thing about this, this is if, I, um, if I'm happy with all the modifications I've done and I just leave play mode, all the values are still persisted, they are saved, and um, you don't have to kind of copy them and uh, add them again. So that's pretty nice, I think. All right, now let's take a look at the hierarchy. Uh, uh, besides the usual suspects like camera and light, we have basically just two things of interest. We have the game controller and the input controller. Now let's take a look at the game controller real quick, because it's, uh, as, as I said, all the logic goes into systems. So this is a really simple class now, because all it does is um, just organizing the, all the systems here in a, in a specific order you want, and that's basically it. These are all the systems used in this game. Here's increment tick, for example, process move, uh, check health, and stuff like that. So that's all there is to it, and everything else is in systems. All right. Now, how do we actually work now with input, for example? So this is uh, the input controller mono behavior, and we're just using the built-in Unity's input system. And we query the x, uh, the x axis and the, hor uh, the horizontal and the vertical axis. We get the values. And the only thing we do is create a new entity, add a move input, and uh, with those values. 
We do exactly the same for shooting. If we shoot, we create a new entity, add a shoot input, and that's basically it. Now, what happens here? Unity provides us with some logic that we haven't uh, written. So we can use this logic. We use it in the model behaviors, and we convert them so we can use them in Entitas and react with reactive system and all this good stuff. And this is basically what you have to do. And if we take a look at the collisions emitter, this is a model behavior that is, that is on every bullet that we shoot. And here we want to just uh, take advantage of the cool physics that Unity provides us. So we implement uh, on collision enter, so we can get notified if there's a collision. And the only thing we do again is we create an entity and add a collision um, component to it. Again, we have external logic that's provided by Unity for us. We can t uh, access the API in, with um, mono behaviors, and we convert it to entities. <coughs> that's good and all, but what about performance, you might ask yourself. And if you ask yourself, this, it, that's actually really good, because we deeply care about performance, and we constantly ask ourselves about this, too. And um, so uh, just yesterday, for fun, uh, <laughs> I did a small comparison, because I was interested, actually, um, how it per Entitas performs versus Unity. So what we've done, each frame, we just crea create a bunch of game objects or entities, and we add two components or two mono behaviors. And on the left, you can see um, how long it took for Unity to create those game objects with the mono behaviors, and on the right, we can see Entitas. So it's, there's a huge difference in performance. So that's, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> and we see also these yellow spikes. This is actually the garbage collector kicking in, because we're creating garbage all the time. And this is something you definitely want to avoid in a real game, because garbage, the garbage collector, those hiccups, they will drop the frame rate and uh, will destroy the user experience. Now, just to give you the facts, I, I created 1,000 objects with two components. And these are the numbers. So the memory consumption of Unity's game, obj uh, game objects were nine times heavier, so n almost three megabytes compared to 0 0.3. And when you take a look at the CPU consumption, it's even worse. So it was 17 times slower, so 105 milliseconds versus six milliseconds. So what does it actually mean? If you have a game with 60 frames per second, you have about 60 milliseconds time to run your logic each frame. So this means you, you could do this, these 1,000 objects with Entitas with six milliseconds twice in one frame, but you cannot with uh, Unity. So, and um, another thing to even more improve the performance is object pools. There are object pools everywhere and also caches everywhere. So this, demo, uh, this performance test what was without using object pools, so the performance is even better. Now, Entitas is reusing entities. Destroyed ones can be reused. Same is true for components. Old one can be just reused, which is pretty nice. So we avoid unnecessary allocations. Also, the groups are cached, and we can do something really nice, which is indexing components. So if you imagine you have millions of entities, each has a unique name, for example, and you're looking for just one entity with a specific name, that might take forever, and, uh, uh, depending on how many entities you have. Now, if you index them, it's basically like in a database. It's constant access time compared to a dictionary lookup, which is basically for free. And we do all this stuff to make accessing, accessing and work with the data as fast as it can be, because that's basically what you do with Entitas all the time. So nice. <laughs> all right, to recap. If you have any external logic, if it's Unity's physics input or whatever, the th rule of thumb is you have to convert it and sync it back to Entitas by creating entities and components. And this basically means two things. Entitas is um, engine agnostic, so you can run it in a um, pure c -sharp project, for example. And um, the other thing is it's really easy to generate these inputs, for example. You can write, really easily write an AI that's just emitting some inputs and pretending it's a player, or you can also record an input, provide this input to, to the game, and you can just replay the game over and over again, which is pretty nice for integration tests or multiplayer games. All right, so that's basically what I wanted to talk about. Well, I see Maxim is already pretty excited because he has a nice demo he wants to share with you guys. Yeah, very excited. Um, so 
everything what we saw was addressing some questions that we had from the last year. And one of the biggest questions was as well is how do we do UI? Because uh, we are kind of preconditioned to think about UI, MVC. UI, I need UI, MVC. And with Entitas, you don't have MVC in a way. Uh, so is it possible to do UI also purely with Entitas? And uh, I created a small demo, and I was inspired by a game. Who actually recognizes the game? Some of you. Who played the game? The same people, good. <laughs> Who maybe worked on this game? OK. <laughs> cool. Uh, so um, with this demo, I would like to just show um, how you can do reactive UIs uh, with uh, Entitas. So let's start. Uh, it is pretty boring, actually. You can just see like the um, time goes by, and you see also that we're producing Elixir, and uh, with the buttons, we actually can consume it. And you see that also the buttons react on uh, consumption, right? So it's kind of a small simulation of just the economy of this game. To do it m a little bit more exciting, what I uh, introduced as well is a time travel feature. So we can actually go back and forth in time and see uh, what happened at uh, which tick. So for example, here we see like seems like we Consumed here, so we can just resume on the second 18 and just go further. OK, so really basic example. Right. So I would like to show you um, how it's been done. <laughs> Is there some problem with a clicker? No. All right. Ah, OK. All right. All right. So uh, there is a quote from Fred Brooks who uh, told, show me your tables, and I won't usually need your flow charts. They will be obvious. Small disclaimer, the uh, quote is from late 70s. So uh, what is it about tables and flow charts? What am I um, talking about? What he meant is basically, show me your data, and it will be obvious how the source code is working if the data is clear. And this is what I would like to do as well with you here, showing you first the data, how it's actually modeled. And then I believe it will be much easier um, for me to talk about the logic behind uh, the game. So we have uh, following components. We have a tick component, which represents the current time. Makes sense, right? Then we have the Elixir component, which represents the amount of Elixir we currently have. We have a um, consume Elixir component. This one will tell us how much Elixir we should consume. And then last but not least is the pause component, which tells us if we are in the pause state or not. This is the heart of uh, this game. This is the heart of this simulation. Generally, we don't have to know anything beyond that. You could all, uh, uh, I guess all of you already um, can think how the logic is implemented. But still, I would like to also show you uh, a few systems. And here we see the tick update system. It's an initialized system. Sorry, I don't have two pointers. That would be really <laughs> badass, but yeah. So. Um, and in the initialize, what we do, we just replace the t uh, tick with 0. So we're starting from the, uh, the beginning, right? And then it is an execute system, meaning that uh, it will be executed on every frame. And if we are not in pause, we will set the tick to current tick plus 1. Otherwise, we won't do anything. By this, we can already uh, implement this pausing inside of the game without pausing in the Unity editor. So we control the time. OK. So then we have this produce Elixir system, which is uh, an initialized system as well. And also here in the initialize method, we just send the uh, Elixir to 0. 
So we're starting from scratch. And it is a reactive system. As Simon already said, reactive systems will be triggered only if there is a change. And in this case, the trigger is the tick. So only if we replacing ticks, this system will be triggered. And this is why we don't have to check for pause state in the system. Because we know we won't uh, change the time if we are paused globally. All right. With these two, um, two systems, we already can represent the basic uh, economy of this game. So we have Elixir, we have time, and then over time we get more and more Elixir. Makes sense, right? Then what happens when we actually push for buttons? Well, in this case, we basically consume and then we have less Elixir, right? So we produce, consume, produce, consume, and, and so on and so forth. This is, again, the basic economy that you have in the game. And in order to uh, be able to do this, we have this um, consume button behavior, which is a mono behavior which implements iPod listener and iElixir listeners. I will talk about them in 10 minutes. Now I would like to concentrate more on this button press method. Which, is, which will be called when you uh, press the button. And in this case, what we do is we create an entity and add consume elixir uh, consumption amount. Does it remind you of something? What Simon showed before? It's basically this again. So we have this input uh, um, coming from the user now, not from the age, uh, engine itself, but we interpret it in the same way. We just basically um, take it from mono, uh, mono behavior and convert it into an entity component, and then we can simulate further. Um, sorry about that. It was a little bit too fast. So uh, in order to do the time travel, what we could do, we could just save all of these points, right? All of this elixir, how much elixir we have, which would be lots of data over time. Or we could just store the consume actions. We should be here just to the um, data points. That's it. And in order to do this, we have another component, which is a consumption history component, which have a list of consumption entries. And consumption entry has only two fields. It's the tick, when the consumption happened, and the amount. So. In this case, time travel becomes less tricky, and it's actually quite easy to implement. So the only missing part is the um, jump in time component. This is a component which tells us what is the target tick. Where should we jump? And again, we have this time picker behavior, which has a changed value. And here, again, we just replay it, seeing the jump in time. And it's this thing again. Just converting input into entities, and now we can work with it and simulate on this, um, track this, and so on and so forth. OK, uh, let's look at the logic. So here we see the list of all of the systems that we have in this um, simple example. We have a root system and a logic system. Those are greens. Those are just parent systems. The only thing that they do, they just uh, execute their children. We use it just uh, in order to be able to kind of uh, group some systems logically, out of convenience, basically. And in the root system, we have this replay system, cleanup system, uh, free notify systems for UI, which I will again speak a little bit later about. And then we have this logic system. And in the logic system, we have only systems which are important for <laughs> the uh, for the simulation itself, for the core economics and core data. And as you can see, the um, tick update system and produce uh, LXC system I uh, already talked about. And we have three more systems which will make the whole example work, which are as simple as the systems that I showed before. So what about replay system? How does it work? Replay system uh, is a reactive system 
which triggers on the component which tells us the target tick. And when it triggers, it will just have a for loop, which will go from 0 to the target tick, and it will just execute the logic systems. That's it. Time travel becomes pretty much trivial to implement. And it's the same way you can do backend validations on your backend. I worked on a simulation game where we um, had to run very complex uh, simulations on the backend, and it was the same idea. Just capture the input, historize it, and run it through. That's it. Now, how do we get a reference to a logic system? Um, why is it generally the problem? Because we try to be very uh, strict about dependencies between systems. We would like to think of systems just as uh, single responsibility elements, which do only one thing. For this, we would like to just not have dependencies between systems. But in this case of a uh, uh, replay system, we would like to replay the logic system. We would like to have a reference to the logic system. And in this case, what we do, we just again use entitas and do also a dependency management with entitas. So we create a logic um, system component, which have just one field, which is a systems uh, reference to a systems class. And when we create the logic systems, we just put them also in the pool. So then we can query this stuff from everywhere if, you, uh, if we like. So we avoid creating singletons. We avoid to, uh, introducing dependency injection frameworks, and so on and so forth. We just use the same patterns as we use for real data, also for the references. OK, so I spoke about simulation. What about the UI? So how does it change, actually? And in this case, as I promised before, I would like to talk about notification systems. We have three of them. Notify tick listener system, notify pause listener system, and notify elixir listener system. This is an example of notify tick listener system. It is a reactive system. It triggers on tick um, changes. And here, what we also do, we say uh, we get the group of all the tick listeners. So we have these listeners. And then when the tick is changed, we will uh, iterate on all the listeners and just call them. Very basic and simple implementation of uh, observe pattern or uh, public subscriber pattern. Again, very simply implemented, no magic. Everything is as you would expect it to be. And here, we just uh, introduce this, uh, interfaces saying we have a tick listener, we have a pause listener, we have an elixir listener. And they will be reflected as components, and we can um, query for them later on. All right. Who's ready for a quiz? I also looted uh, one candy bar. <laughs> it was hard to get. <laughs> so uh, I will ask you a couple of questions now, and the one who will uh, actually reply to it will get this candy bar. So pay attention. All right. So here you can see the basic UI. I'm sorry, I will show it here for the guys over there. But it's so we have eight UI elements. We have this slider. We have this um, time label. We have a pause button, a consumption button, consumption button, consumption button, uh, amount of Elixir as a label, and then Elixir as a bar. Those are eight UI elements which we have on the scene. What do you think? How many of them are tick listeners? Who wants chocolate? One. 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 It's one. Great. 
Already three candidates for uh, um, uh, one chocolate. We can split it. No worries. We're all friends here. All right. So next question. Elixir listener, how many? Four, three, four, why four? Who said five? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay, it is actually five. You can see it here because like, we definitely have to listen to the Elixir amount in the label, in the bar, but also on the consumption button because it, they fill out. Right? So you would like to exchange them also dependent on the uh, LXE amount. All right. Last question. Pause listener. Who hmm? <laughs> 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 <Nah. laughs> Not yet. Two, three. That's a tricky one. That's a tricky question. But it's not all of them. So. Who said five? <laughs> <laughs> Who said, ah, okay. <laughs> so it is five. A little bit unexpected, right? So you, you can imagine the pause button has to listen because it would like to switch to resume, right? This makes sense. The slider also have to listen because it actually has to appear. What about the consumption buttons? Well, with the consumption, when we are in pause, we would like to disable them. Because that would be cheating in a way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a little bit defensive programming, so it should, uh, I could completely remove this statement, actually. But still, it is much better because also with the UI, if it's disabled, it's grayed out, so you can tap it. And with this if statement, it was just, well, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. So uh, I would like to still show you how this consumption button uh, behavior implemented in regards to notification. What we do basically in the awake method, we create a pool, we create an entity, and add pause listener and elixir listener with reference to yourself, which is a simple way to tell I'm the subscriber. Please send me notifications. And then we also implement this uh, interfaces, which is, again, very simple. So if it's post state changed, we even get the, po uh, the values inside. So we don't have to like query the pools and so on and so forth. So we just say enabled if it's not post. And then with the Alexia amount change, we again just change this fill out uh, image, which is on top of the button itself. Right, so it was like lots of stuff, and I would like to show you the demo again because now you kind of uh, completely know how it works underneath. And here we go again. So as you can see, time is coming by. These guys are reacting. This is reacting. This is reacting. I'm consuming. Everything reacts nicely to these things. And then as well, I can just. Let's wait a little bit, and boom, again. Then we can pause. We see the slider. Let's have a look at the pool, at the entities. As, as you can see, we have all these entities there. This is the listeners. Uh, we have the tick, which is the current um, time that we are pausing at. right? We have the elixir as well. And here, what Simon likes to do, is to cheat a little bit, always. If he presents something, he, he, um, he cheats all the time. So uh, he would like to like, increase the amount. And you can see, actually, when I'm changing the value, it still reacts nicely. But let's say we have um, now LXC of 14. We just cheated. We said we are very rich. We g generated a lot of stuff. But if we will replay, we get to 1 again. Because when we're doing the uh, re-simulation of the game, we captured the time 
how much it was in reality, so we can re-evaluate everything and get to the right amount of Elixir. This is a very simple way of how to do anti-cheating on the back end wherever you want. Baked in. Very simple. Tricky uh, ideas become almost trivial in a way. One thing that I uh, would like to show again is basically how the um, systems um, sweat a little bit when we do the replay. So it's not optimized. It wasn't, uh, it, uh, this demo didn't went through the profiler-driven development yet. So you can see that it's uh, actually something, if we go to the uh, longer time, it's a little bit more. But still, if you think about it, if you would like to implement it as a backend validation, on the backend it would be still fine. If it takes a little bit of time, but it is deterministic, you will get the same results all over the place. There is very hard to cheat this stuff. All right. Cool. So let's have a short recap what we kind of have here. One of the things uh, which I found very important is control your input. Even if it's time, in this case, time is input as well. So it's nice to just translate this input into something that you have control of and also can set yourself and do unit testing with this and so on and so forth, like validate it on the backhand. Input is state change. It really is. Also, not when you're programming with entities. If, like, time getting by, it's your state changing. It was one, two, three, four, five. It's a state change for your game. Simulation is state change over time, real time now. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit confusing, but, uh, like, um, and last year, and uh, I kind of still believe that uh, games are just interactive simulations from the uh, programmer standpoint. And if you get all your state together and uh, uh, control your input, then lots of tricky parts become very trivial. Again, state change drives the UI update. It's much easier to just listen to the state change and change the UI like this than having some kind of a weird, de weird dependencies between model view and controller, which knows too much or too little, and have all these religious uh, uh, wars about does this code belong to controller or to the view? Maybe. Let's put it in model. Why not? Here it's kind of everything. You have your data. You have your systems which change the data. That's it. Now, um, this is kind of like the two points here, kind of, uh, kind of suggestions in a way. So it's nice to persist only relevant parts of your state for replay. We could persist also all of the Elixir points through all of the ticks, but it would be a huge amount of data, and it's actually not really necessary. In some cases, you would have to, for performance reasons, to persist a little bit more than just input, but then you are in control. You have everything, and you can decide yourself, is it enough to persist the little things, or should we actually persist something on a bigger scale? And then again, for us, it was uh, easy to use Entitas also as uh, dependency management. We um, kind of started doing it when we ripped off the core uh, logic of the game and put it uh, on a stateless worker on the back end. And then we saw that we still had some dependencies, and it was the easiest way of representing them as well, just as components in the pool, and have your dependency context, again, just as an entity's pool, as it is. It solves the problems with stubbing, with testing, and so on and so forth. OK, if you forget everything that we just told, this is the only image that is like essential in a way. Just take the input, convert it to entities, and then the systems will take care of it. They will start simulating and doing all the stuff. Right, so those were all the points that we went through, and we have like a small bonus thoughts. We didn't know how much time we'll have, so we still have like five minutes. Great. Uh, 
So let's think about how hard is it to implement multiplayer games with such an uh, architecture. And you can uh, see that the game that I was inspired uh, of is also a multiplayer game. And here, it doesn't matter if the input comes from the button, press of the user, or over the network. If it will tell me this, uh, the other guys just consumed or released a unit at this tick, following unit, you can even uh, make sure that you can re-simulate the latency time that you had before. Or you just send it to your backend, and the backend is the authority which tells you, like, OK, this is where it should be right now. Backend validation, I already spoke about it. It becomes really easy if you can rip off some logic from your client and put it on the backend. Who likes to do tutorials and quest systems? Three guys, four guys, maybe six. Why? Because it's tricky normally, right? It's slapped on top of the game. Uh, you have already all the logic in place. And then someone tells you, OK, I you have to monitor stuff. And <coughs> with this thing, what we spoke about is just a matrix which you can uh, observe. The tutorial and quest systems becomes orthogonal. You're just basically observing the state changes and user inputs and can easily see if the tutorial and quest was succeeded or not, if it changed or not. And then, again, the same applies to any kind of logging. Analytics, for example. It's easy to say, like, on this uh, game state uh, um, change, uh, it will become my data point for my analytics uh, server, whatever. So if I will go to this uh, position and <coughs> I change my position, for example, or I shot, then I would like to just send it to, the, uh, uh, to my analytics service, <laughs> saying, like, OK, this guy shot again. And you can evaluate how many shots you had, and so on and so forth. All right? Now, we, are, we really love NTT component system architecture, and we're really enjoying using NTTasks every day. And if you want to get involved or if you want to go and play around with it, uh, make sure to go to the GitHub, GitHub repository, and you will also find both of the demos we showed you today, so you can get started and see how we actually did it. And there are also a few other example projects that might help you getting started with this. Right. So, so if you have any questions, yeah. Just let's wait for Mike. Yeah. <coughs> Oops. Hi. Your slide is in the first section. You had uh, Unity mono behaviors and uh, entity uh, components basically being created. Mm -hmm. uh, you have implemented a variant of the MVC pattern, in which case you are going to have one entity component map to a UI object in general. Mm -hmm. Would you not have, in a regular scenario, both Entitas components and Unity components running, so you incur about 20% overhead? So generally, uh, would you like on? Yeah. Fine. So generally, uh, we will, as Unity is the engine which renders everything. This is basically the view for us, right? And it also, in a way, also this mono behavior has become kind of uh, idiomatic controllers, which take the input of user and also the engine itself. So in order to be able to actually see something, we could implement the whole game just in Entitas, and then it will all work, but you won't see anything. But you can totally test it, and it will be like a headless, crazy um, simulation. But still, we need to create these game objects to be able to see something. The question is, again, if you have logical uh, entities, those doesn't have to be game objects. Because the game objects are heavy. They are meant to be 3D objects, rendering stuff, being uh, uh, responsible for physics engine, and so on and so forth. This is why it is nicer to implement logical things in a lightweighted way 
and the things that has to be like visualized and rendered as game objects for sure. So we will still have game objects, but uh, we will use them only in places which we need them to be, and not just for some logical st uh, stuff which can easily be much more lightweighted. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, there's uh, cases when you uh, w when it's hard to um, create a deterministic uh, uh, state of the game. For example, in if uh, you uh, spawn units and mm -hmm. they uh, collide with each other, and uh, it it creates uh, unpredictable situation. Mm -hmm. So how yep. you will handle it? Uh, to like replay the state mm -hmm. of the game and stuff. Well, I'm not sure if, uh, well, you like, uh, <laughs> I would say uh, yeah. this, this is in fact deterministic. So you get the, the, the goal is to get the same results every time. So, um, or did I get it wrong? Uh, I will just repeat the question. And uh, so basically, if you have a full fledged game, not the, just the, uh, the elixir um, consumption production, and you actually have units which will um, collide with uh, each other, will it break deterministic behavior? If you use a uh, physics engine which is not deterministic, it will break it. But what you can do in this case, if you can't have your own uh, physics engine which is deterministic, you should uh, save this collision information again as a state. So you take it for granted. This is an angle for someone to cheat. They can try to kind of like feed you wrong input saying like it collided, but in reality it didn't. But this is the price that you pay if you use a third party system, which is not deterministic. You just have to say, like, okay, everything else I would like to have deterministic. This I don't have control uh, of, so I will just take it as, it as input and I will just store it as it is. And for replay, I will just say, like, okay, at this time there was a collision. I can't validate it anymore, but at least now uh, the simulation on the back end can say, like, okay, there was a collision between this entity and this entity. I know uh, how much health I should for example, take, how much damage I should deal, what uh, implications should it have on the pathfinding, and so on and so forth. But in the like, perfect scenario, you would have all the systems de deterministic. Then you wouldn't have to save this uh, output of these systems as input for your own systems. Make sense? Um, hello, my name is Nia. I am from Israel, I'm from Israel. and at the beginning of your uh, presentation, we've seen that and that Unity uh, straightforward mechanism has its flaws and has its weaknesses, mm -hmm. and this is why you developed Entitas. Yep. But we all know also that no system is perfect, and every system has its weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell us about some weaknesses or, uh, or behavior, behaviors that are below uh, what you would wish it to be uh, that you encountered with Entitas? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. So, like, it's not built in, <laughs> right? So it's a third party thing which you have to do. Yeah. So if it would be built in directly in the into the Unity, it would be much easier to do if uh, there would be a way of have lightweight components. One of the stuff, I guess, that people actually stumble upon in the beginning when they start with uh, Entitas, and actually we showed it in depth last year, so we didn't repeat it this year. But to, in order to have really nice API and also have uh, all these object pools, we actually have a code generation step which creates all of these nice uh, APIs and all these uh, like hidden performance uh, optimizations, which are still, there is no magic, but it would be just tedious to write them each time yourself. 
So we generate this code which will actually do it for you. You just have to call replace, for example. And we have this component. We will just call that it was removed and it was added with new values. And we reuse this component. We don't instantiate this object again. This is why it's all garbage free. Yeah. Doing it on your own would be very tedious. Doing it with code generation has some pitfalls as well, but we are working on it to make it like, much more seamless um, to work with. Yeah, that's basically um, the only main complaint I remember as well, which is the code generation. It's not about the pattern entity component system, but m more than kind of the implementation. But there will, we, we are addressing this issue as well with the code generation. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that? Um, One more thing, uh, ECS as it is, it's not about entities. It's generally ECS. It's a different way of thinking. And it, uh, as most of us were like, educated in a typical object-oriented uh, programming style, it takes a little bit of mind shift to say, like, OK, I don't do this stuff uh, from top level to the bottom. With uh, ECS, what you do, you just think about what kind of data do you have at the bottom? And then by composing these atomic small things, you get something specific. But it's kind of the same with Unity, actually, and game objects, in a way. Like, mono behaviors, again, become more object-oriented uh, as it is. But if you think about just game objects and mono behaviors, they are still this uh, aggregation of state. Was it the last question? OK. Thank you very much, Thank guys. Thank you very much.